So it's 601, so we'll go ahead and get started. I know a few people will come in. Again, thank you so much for being here. This is our second uh, session of a Kennedy Conversation, um, and it's um, pretty much a repeat of the first one. We may have received additional questions since our first conversation. Uh, so we you may have in, you may embed some um, additional information that we may not have shared at the last meeting relative to those additional questions that uh, we were receiving. So what I want to do is um, in a moment, I'm going to share my screen and um, talk for a minute. But the purposes of that is a couple of things. One is to present to you um, how we got to this point, basically. And I'll share an agenda there, but also the things that I'm going to share is in response to some of the questions that we. Larry Engelbrick has joined the meeting. Some of the questions that we received. Uh, many of you have, may have submitted questions, uh, and so we want to make sure we uh, try to answer those questions. And then I want to leave some time because we did call this a Kennedy conversation. It's not a conversation if I'm doing all the talking. Um, some time for you to um, ask us any questions, share any concerns. And they will also share with you additional ways uh, beyond this that you can provide feedback. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started and jump in here. I'm going to share my screen. OK, um, so you may notice um, some people come in and you may hear their names uh, being announced as they come in. We tried to turn that off, uh, but not, I'm not having any luck with that. So please excuse that. All right, Anna, I see you. Can you see my screen? Awesome. Okay. So again, this is our second um, uh, Kennedy conversation. We had our first one on March the 30th. And let my mouse here? Okay, here we go. So we also, on April... The first, I believe it was, um, launched a thought exchange. Many of you may be familiar with thought exchange, either from uh, this setting. We also launched a thought exchange uh, several months ago when we were getting input on how we were responding to uh, the pandemic and I think a couple of other areas um, that we um, launched thought exchange. So what's on your screen now? Anna, can you see the thought exchange? OK, perfect. Let me back up. So those of you that have not participated uh, in the thought exchange or if you have participated, you still can continue to participate. You're not seeing the thought exchange, Anna? I see the slide that says thought exchange. OK, but not the actual. Not the actual thought exchange. OK, let's see here. Let's do this. Okay, let me do this. Apologize. We'll do it this way. Okay, are you seeing the thought exchange now, Anna? With the QR code and the number. Okay, perfect. I'll say, okay, thank you. So if you have participated, if you have not participated, you can just simply scan this. Um, QR code with your camera on your phone, and it should take you to um, the the website to provide that feedback. Or you can type in tejoin, T-E-J-O-I-N.com. Go to that website and then uh, log into this, um, and then enter the following number, 808-660-634. And the question that we're asking is, what is top of mind for you as, as you consider the proposal to develop an early childhood community center and transition Kennedy K-5 students to Prairie Park, New York, and Quartley? And so those of you that may be on um, right now um, live, it's kind of showing some thoughts of either the people that have already completed um, and shared thoughts or the individuals that um, are currently sharing thoughts. And so what you're seeing on your screen now is the top rated thought. So once you share your thought, you then can go in and rate others thoughts. And so obviously the higher the rating, the higher 
this particular number, this 4.5 is, and it rises to the top as what's considered, what are the top thoughts? And so just currently right now, as of today, these are the current top thoughts. One, it feels intentional that the, the lowest income school was targeted for closing. Uh, the second one is Kennedy serves a lot of high risk students. Uh, taking away the school near where many of our students already live will cause unnecessary hardships for those who struggle with transportation. Uh, the family serving this school will be the least able to help students get to and from school and have fewest resources to advocate for themselves. Um, these students are just as important as others throughout the, dis throughout the district. Certainly um, agree with, with all of this. Transportation is another concern. How will the district handle transportation issues for those being filtered to other schools? Uh, the transition of students and staff. And so um, obviously we've been looking at these. And so I will address uh, definitely these these top thoughts and, and, and others throughout the presentation. But this will remain live through tomorrow evening at five. Um, as you know, we are preparing for uh, our board meeting on on Monday. So you have throughout this meeting, um, the remainder of this evening to, and tomorrow by five uh, to share us your, to, to give us your thoughts on on this particular um thought exchange. Now, let me go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so what we'll share today, we'll talk about the history, um, our connection to our strategic plan. Join the meeting. Um, uh, what some of the research says, uh, Douglas, we'll look at some of Douglas County's work, the why, what we're proposing, and um, what's what's possible. Excuse me. Many of you may have seen or heard this quote, you can't control the wind, but you can adjust the sails. Um, you know, for the past several years, the winds for us in many school districts in Kansas has been school finance uh, and our local school budgets. Those are the winds that we have constantly, we are constantly having to adjust our sails to. Um, prior to me arriving in Lawrence, I think back in 2011, there was conversations about closing um, schools. There was a um, Save Our Schools uh, movement. Um, this is not the first time that uh, discussions have come up about potentially making Kennedy an early childhood center. Um, this is certainly not the first time that discussions have come up about closing um, some, some of our elementary schools. And so what happened uh, as a result of that um, we passed a, well, you with the community helped us pass $87 million bond and we invested in our schools instead of, instead of closing them. And so with that, we, we, we adjusted our, our, our sales. And so how, 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 however, as our enrollment has been flat over the past um, many years, it's either been flat or maybe a slight uptick or a slight decline. Uh, another strong gust of wind, huge strong gust of wind came uh, in the form of, of COVID-19. No one predicted COVID-19. I don't think there was anyone that knew that, that this was coming and the impact that it would have on everybody's lives. But certainly no one predicted the impact that it would have on, on schools. And as, as we talk to other schools, districts around the country, uh, typically school districts have lost anywhere from five to six percent uh, of their enrollment. And we're right there in, in that boat in terms of losing about five to six percent of our enrollment as a result of, of, of COVID-19. So we have to adjust our sales again and this time significantly. And so although we are not proposing to close the doors to Kennedy, uh, we do acknowledge um, that we are closing K-5 and uh, we do acknowledge that loss there. Um, however, we are proposing to repurpose Kennedy into an early childhood community center. Um, and I do mean community. We'll talk about that word community uh, in here in a, in, a, in a little bit. And so again, this is uh, definitely emotional. Uh, it's emotional for staff, families, and other community members that don't even have kids in Kennedy. Uh, it's emotional for them um, as, as well. Not to mention at the end of a pandemic, you know, we're, we're, we're having these conversations. Um, and so we are, at a, we are at a critical point in time. And so the question remains, where do we where do we go from here? So real briefly, if you look at kind of where we've been with these conversations, both nationally at a state level and, and locally, you'll see there on the timeline. I will not read all those bullet points to you, 
But you can see that conversations have been taking place um, as it relates to early childhood in, in this area. Again, state, local, um, and, and national levels. 2009, um, our Early Childhood Readiness Center moved to Kennedy. I think it moved from, from East Heights. Uh, 2013, President Obama announced preschool for all. And if I were to go back even farther to President Lyndon B. Johnson's um, war on poverty with uh, Head Start, um, there was a move then for early, early learning. 2018, our Lawrence Douglas County Public Health Equity Report was released. And our Douglas County Health Report, um, health, I'm sorry, health plan came from that. Most recently in 2021, our anti-poverty plan um, addition to Douglas County Health Plan was released. And 2021, February 24, 2021, our Budget and Program Evaluation Committee, which is a committee that's comprised of certified staff here in the district. And so that would be your licensed teachers, um, counselors, those, those certified staff. So we have some representation from our certified staff, have representation from our classified staff. So those would be like paras or facilities and operations folks. We have a couple of board members um, on that, the meeting. that committee and some um, administrators on that. And their, one of their primary roles is, first of all, to understand school finance, how, the, how that works, and then listen to and make recommendations um, to the board to, to consider. And so this committee was, I guess, rehashed or reformed probably about maybe two years ago now, if I'm not uh, incorrect, uh, again, for the purposes of really providing um, multiple multiple perspectives at the table to um, analyze and examine our school budgets and, and, and make recommendations. And uh, before I go on, I, I do want to say that the, the chat is is live. Um, if you have a question or a comment or a concern, uh, place it in the chat. I know Julie Boyle is, is working or has been working uh, on, on the chat. Uh, and I, I will say this, I've, I've been accused of um, um, talking fast and using big words to try to get this through. Uh, I'm, I'm just a country boy from Alabama. I don't have many big words to use, first of all. Um, and I, I, I operate, try to operate with a high level of transparency. And so if there's a question that you have uh, or a point that you want to make sure um, we, we hear, um, that the chat is there um, as well. So how does this connect to our strategic plan? We made a promise to this community uh, with your input, those that were able to participate in our strategic plan, that we wanted to ensure that students of all races, backgrounds, and abilities achieve at high levels, demonstrate proficiency in reading by third grade and in math by eighth grade. We examined our data. We examined national data. We know what, well, we may, we may not know, but the research around third grade students um, and being able to read on grade level by third grade, the impacts of, of students not being able to read by third grade uh, is very de detrimental to, to students. Uh, and then math by eighth grade, what the research says is if students are not performing in math on grade by eighth grade, their likelihood to drop out of high school is, is increased greatly. And then ultimately want them to graduate on time, prepared for success in college and careers. So we cannot wait to third grade to work hard to make sure that they're on uh, reading on grade level. We cannot wait until eighth grade to work hard to make sure that they're performing math on eighth grade on eighth grade level. This has to start as soon as they leave the mother's room, to be honest with you. And that's why we're excited about our parents as, as teachers and our tiny K and definitely what um, um, our folks at our early childhood centers are doing. And then just what our kindergarten, first grade, second grade teachers are doing to prepare our students to, to, be, to be reading on grade level by third. So the connections here, again, I won't read all this. One of the things that, that's in our strategic plan is, I'll just draw your attention to number two, is to decrease the barriers to college and career readiness. And notice it says pre-K through 12th grade and, and beyond. Uh, and again, we want to meet the students' unique academic, social, em and emotional and behavioral needs. Data-formed decisions is also um, another theme in our, our strategic plan, and I'll draw your attention to number one here. Use data to inform all instructional decisions. Uh, develop systems that support student-focused database um, decision-making. And then B here, allocate resources according to research-based best practices for um, student success. So just wanted to kind of um, make the connection to 
um, the work that we're proposing at Kennedy to our, our strategic plan. I will not spend a lot of time on what the research says around um, the benefits of early learning. Um, I think everyone understands that it's clear that if students are engaged in quality early childhood programs, um, their likelihood of being successful K-5 is, is a lot greater. Um, this, this particular research points out too that they're less likely to be retained in, in, in a grade, uh, more likely to graduate from high school than their peers. Um, and um, is this the one that talks about, uh, yeah, less likely to be placed in special education as well if they are uh, enrolled in quality early, early childhood. And again, we'll, we will make this presentation of, of available. Uh, there are some other links to, to research there. Again, the goal of kindergarten readiness um, is to just make sure our students are able to be successful uh, at the age of five, be successful socially, emotionally, academically, and prepared for success. So those successful transitions um, um, are, are most strongly influenced by children's, uh, a child's home environment, by their preschool program that, that they are attending, whether it's home daycare or an established um, early childhood provider here in the city or, or one of our early childhood classrooms. Um, we know that high quality preschool experiences benefit students' cognitive development, their social development, um, and, and beyond. And so again, we wanna make sure, because what the fact of the matter is we're seeing more students coming to us uh, at the kindergarten level, not having the benefit of being in a high quality um, early childhood uh, classroom. So real briefly, Douglas County's work, I mentioned the 2018 Health Equity Plan, um, you know, that, that kind of highlights um, the, some of the troubling inequi inequities here in Douglas County, including that all minority populations except Asian population have lower educational attainment than white the white population and the, and, and the county average. Additionally, black and Native American male residents do not graduate as as high of rates as their, their, their counterparts. And this, this report um, informed the Douglas County Community Health Plan and it, it is available on, on, on their website. And what we know about Kennedy Elementary is that it, it serves um, a large percent of economic, economically disadvantaged um, students. And so investing early on in early childhood education in an area um, like Kennedy, uh, in one of our most disadvantaged neighborhoods, is certainly a research-based strategy uh, in terms of improving not only the academic, social, and emotional outcomes of students, but those health outcomes that this report um, um, mentioned. Um, it also mentioned in this report life expectancy from East Lawrence to West Lawrence. Startlingly, it's a 10-year difference, eight to 10-year difference in life expectancy just based on where you live, what side of town you live on. Um, and also in the health equity re uh, report, there are various um, social determinants of health um, that the CDC uh, has released a, a framework. Um, I think it's called Healthy People 2020, but it line, the, the work that's in the Douglas County Health Equity Report aligns to that work. And these are the five areas that um, in the Douglas County Health Equity Report, you note number two um, as being a social determinant of health is education, early childhood development, and indeed literacy. The most recent addition to the Douglas County Health Report is uh, the anti-poverty plan. Uh, a partner, the partners at United Way um, helped, helped lead the charge on that plan as well, which um, was also approved by the Douglas County Human Services Coalition um, they pretty much developed, uh, uh, I'm sorry, facilitated the development of, of a set of goals, a set of goals and objectives to, to, to basically foster a more equitable Douglas County. So what are those barriers, you know, as, as, as it relates to why is there a life expectancy, a difference in life expectancy from East Lawrence to West Lawrence? What are those additional barriers to employment? Uh, and so on your screen, what you're seeing is, is some of those reported employment barriers that's noted in, the, in this report. And here, right here, fourth way down is uh, childcare, you know, as being a barrier to um, um, employment. I often tell people that the work that I wanna do and the work that we should be doing here in Lawrence Public Schools and in this community 
should be legacy work. And that's work that's going to outlive us. I mentioned President Lyndon B. Johnson was back, what, 1950s, 60s, a war on poverty, and we're still fighting poverty. Um, I think it was Einstein said that, you know, um, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different different results. And so at some point, we just have to look at, look at doing something um, a lot differently. After completing the survey, again, from the anti-poverty plan, um, teams met with focus groups, and they identified a number of strategies to, to help create policy, help create systems, help disrupt systems um, that will foster environmental changes, um, behavioral changes, um, to ensure that there was a high percentage of our children, um, particularly those that are economically disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged, many of our BIPOC or Black, Indigenous, and people of color that are living in poverty, ensuring, ensuring that their um, um, poverty rates don't increase. And so these are a couple of the strategies that they mentioned in this plan. Launch a pilot to provide high quality and affordable early child care. There may be high quality child care available, but is it affordable? Um, and affordable to many of our, to, 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 in, in, in my sense of a word, is, is free um, uh, from age birth to, to kindergarten. And plan strategy three, develop a coordinated early child care and educational system to maximize child care industry resources, acquisition, and uh, efficiencies. So again, what we know about child care is that access to affordable quality child care is indeed essential for working parents to enter. And if, if we think about where we are at the end of this pandemic, to re-enter and stay in the workforce. Um, however, it's it's hard to come by. Um, child care, as we, as we know, is a two-generation workforce issue. Uh, according to the United States Chamber of Commerce, 74 percent of working parents said that their jobs have been affected by child care breakdown in the last year. And then locally here in Douglas County, there are less than 200 slots available for the 1,200 children born each year in Douglas County. Less than 200 slots available for the 1,200 children born here in, in, in Douglas County. And so we all know, again, the, the first years of life are, are critical for children to build those strong foundational um, skills in which, you know, our their future um, of learning is is, is built on. Uh, yet the, the supply cannot meet the, the demand. So the big question that I've been hearing and that we've been getting is, is why? Why Kennedy? Um, uh, and so I want to spend the next few moments just really talking about about the why. Um, and, and I'll first say this. Lawrence Public Schools is is committed to serving and supporting every single Gabrielle student um, in this has district joined the meeting with the, the best possible education, no matter where you where you go. Uh, if you were to dive a little deeper into our strategic plan, you will see a, a theme called co cohesive curriculum that just speaks to that. It doesn't matter which school you attend, you will get the same rigorous instruction. And so that's that that's our commitment. Um, the. And as I mentioned, the district has considered in the past um, closing other buildings due to underutilized uh, capacities due to low enrollment. Um, some of you may remember remember that some of those schools were New York, Cordley, um, Hillcrest, uh, I think Pinckney um, was also considered. And so this this conversation is certainly not unique to to Kennedy. Um, as a matter of fact, I think there were some conversations about 12 years ago. Um, about potentially making Kennedy an early childhood center. So this is not something that we just sat here. And I will say we don't make decisions in isolation. I don't just sit here in, in this office and, and make decisions uh, in, in, in isolation. Um, this is something, again, that is certainly not unique to, to Kennedy. However, if you look at um, our Kennedy K-5 enrollment projections in November, October, November, RSP, those are some consultants that specialize in school enrollment and enrollment projections. They presented um, their findings to, to our board in October, November, and they shared the projections of um, um, enrollment of all of our buildings. And what they shared with us is, uh, again, the current enrollment, the enrollment projections, as well as building utilization capacities. And so what you're seeing on the screen is enrollment uh, projections. So here we are, 20, 2021, 
and we are around 185. I think we're maybe around 170 over at Kennedy um, right now, maybe a little less. But their, the projections are by 24, 25 to be around 167. If we take a look at building capacity, um, based on RSP's recommendation, um, building utilization capacity, if there is a sweet spot or a recommendation of what should a building capacity be um, in terms of ensuring that the district will be able to maximize staffing allocations and making sure the district can provide some type of consistency between buildings in terms of delivery of services uh, to students. What you see on the screen, again, what they say is 85 to 95 um, percent. But what you see on the screen is Kennedy's projected uh, current and projected building um, capacity. Again, this is K-5 projected capacity. Again, looking at 23, 24, 24, 25, that capacity is low, will, will be as low as 41 percent. However, in the past two or three years, um, I think we've been operating still below 50 percent capacity. So talk a little bit about our enrollment decline and how it affects um, budgets. Um, I won't go deep in too deep into this. I just want to point a couple of things out on, the, on this slide. Uh, as I mentioned, our Budget and Program Evaluation Committee first learns about Kansas School Finance and can the, the Kansas School Finance formula. And it's based on what you will hear us refer to as FTE. And what that means is full full time equivalency. Uh, and so that's based on student enrollment. Enrollment drives our, 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 our budget. And so Lawrence experienced a 400 and close to 478 um, FTE enrollment decrease and a 307.4 uh, weighting FTE decrease in the fall of 2020. So just this past fall, uh, we, we saw those, those decreases. And so what does that mean? Essentially, unaudited estimates reflect a $1.8 million loss of funding uh, in the current fiscal year. So basically, we have to submit to the state what our enrollment projections, what we expect our enrollment projections to be. There's a September count date that we have to report to the state, did those students show up from our projections? And so based on our count in September, we were down about 600 um, students. So because of that and, and the waiting formula, um, again, based on our um, um, uh, low, basically our free and reduced lunch rate, we're also giving um, additional funds for, for waiting in that current year. So this third bullet, the estimated permanent and ongoing loss for funding into fiscal year 21-22 is $1.2 million. So if we look at that 1.8 loss of funding for this current year, we, we, we got to the 1.2, assuming that at least 50% of our students um, that were not enrolled come back to us in the fall of 2021. If they don't come back to us, that $1.2 million will, will, will be higher. So again, that speaks to that fourth bullet point. Unless the student enrollment returns, um, the 22-23 fiscal year could bring additional funding decreases. So we're talking about Kennedy right now. Um, however, um, if, if students don't return or we see an additional decrease in students, we'd probably be talking about another school um, or more schools uh, or other major cuts um, in the upcoming year. So again, the Budget and Program Evaluation Committee looked at all of that, and they looked at multiple um, options or scenarios. And so when we were asked the question, you know, um, what other options did the district consider? You know, the Budget and Program Evaluation Committee were presented options and explored options, and they voted to support the Kennedy Early Childhood Center proposal. Let me try to move um, a little quicker than what I've been moving here. Uh, so the, the, the proposal, what we're proposing um, is... Um, well, this is more on budget and staffing. Um, I think I mentioned most of that on my previous slide. Staffing pretty much drives enrollment. Um, yeah. Has left the meeting. Let me go on. So the estimated savings. And so when we think about, say, so if we repurpose Kennedy, um, what savings will, will we see there? And so those positions that will be reduced through attrition, meaning we have some teachers that retire and we're able to um, move some staff into those uh, positions. Um, so we will have staff that will be placed 
um, and or have the opportunity to be placed at any other open position in the school. So the savings, uh, let me go to the savings. The savings will be $722,000 from the repurposing of Kennedy. How we get to those savings are listed here. And they pretty much come from um, um, staffing. Um, the largest percent of our budget goes to staffing. And so you're, what you're seeing on the screen are those staff positions, excuse me, that will um, um, come from Kennedy or that, that we will save from Kennedy um, to get to this, this, this 722. So the next question is, um, where, will, where, will, where will students go? And, oh, let, oh, let, me, let me stay on this slide for a minute. Our goal is to make sure that the staff that's currently at Kennedy will follow the students. And I'll share with those schools, and you may have already, well, those schools are on there. They will travel to Prairie Park, New York, and or Courtly. So we want to make sure that the staff, to the maximum extent appropriate, and we're about 99% sure that that, that the staff at Kennedy can follow the students at, at, at those schools. So where will the students go again? Those moving to you, to New York, Gabrielle, and Curry Park. Has left the meeting. So students that are residing within Glen Drive, Maple Lane, 19th and Harper um, section here will move to New York. Students that are residing south of 19th, north of 23rd, west of Harper uh, will move to Cordley, and students that are residing south of 15th, east of Harper, and north of 23rd um, uh, will travel to um, Prairie Park. Oh, I'll go back there. So again, the concerns I think you saw in, in the thought exchange and questions and concerns from our previous meeting and questions that we were receiving were around um, uh, transportation. Well, what I shared at the last um, Kennedy conversation we are in the process of assessing to see what the cost will be. We know it will be an additional cost. What the cost will be, because currently in order for a family or child to get transportation, they have to live uh, more than two and a half miles from the school. So we're in the process of analyzing to see if we cut that down just during this transition year, if we cut that down to two miles, what the, what would the cost be? If we cut it down to um, 1.5 miles, what that, what that cost will be. So we will have that cost um, ready to share um, by Monday. We we'll also hear concerns about uh, children having to cross um, busy streets. Um, similar to some of our other schools, we will continue to partner with um, the city. We will continue to partner with safe routes to safe routes to school schools. We currently have students that are crossing 23rd Street, uh, which is a busy street, Massachusetts Street, um, and and Iowa Street. We currently have crossing guards there to assist with students uh, crossing um, those those streets. So we, again, we'll, we'll have uh, crossing guards at those other um, streets that students may have to, to cross. We also talked, to, talked about, um, you know, the impact of the receiving schools and what that enrollment will, will look like. I, and I promise I won't spend too much time on these, but I'll just share what, because you'll see three other slides that, that will look like this. The numbers you're seeing here this is kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. These are the number of students in two kindergarten classes, so 16 and 16. This is after the, the Kennedy students uh, moved to New York. What, what, what would that mean for New York? So New York's total enrollment down here will be 221. Uh, kindergarten classes, 16, first grade, 19, uh, 15 in each second grade class. 30, I'm sorry, 22 in each third grade class and so on. Um, New York, we get questions about title services. We know Kennedy is a Title I school. New York is currently a Title I school uh, and will continue to become a, a, I'm sorry, will continue to remain a Title I school. Those students that go, that will attend Corley, this is the impact of those classrooms there. Um, currently, Corley is not a, a Title I school. Um, 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 Zach, who's our director of assessment, research and accountability data, um, he's working with Kathy and they're both out right now. Zach uh, just had a baby. Well, he didn't have a baby. His wife had a baby and um, kept, Kathy's out um, due to some medical issues. But they are looking at those numbers. Um, at minimum, we believe that that Corley will at minimum either be a title one school or a, or targeted school uh, where they will have some um, uh, support uh, financially there. And then this is Prairie Park, 
what those uh, size, what the classrooms will look like there. Same thing as Corley. Uh, we believe Prairie Park more than likely will be a Title I school uh, or a school that will see targeted assistance, financial assistance to support um, the transition there. And I will say this, in addition, uh, we are in the process of looking at and uh, analyzing how we will spend our ESSER funds, the funds that we receive from the federal government that we have to spend over the next three years. We're looking at those funds and to see how we can support um, students uh, at these buildings um, as, as well. And then finally, um, what's 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 possible? You know, so what will happen at at, at Kennedy? Uh, again, I mentioned we want this to be a early childhood community center. Um, and the fact of the matter of, of, is this: um, this could be a tremendous transformational opportunity for the scholars, for the families, and for the entire Kennedy community. Um, and to be honest, in order for us to continue to make progress toward our, our goals um, and response to the, the needs of our staff, students, and, and community, um, we have to make some, some tough and sometimes drastic uh, decisions. So we are, we're, we're really at that pivotal, pivotal point. And so what we're looking at, again, is expansion of quality, early childhood seats for families that, that qualify, center-based, potential center-based medical and dental clinics in the building, um, center-based behavioral health uh, services, human service providers, early childhood partners um, will have an opportunity to receive professional development there, um, early childhood provider incubator. If there's a family, um, I'm sorry, a um, yeah, an individual that's interested in starting an early childhood business, that could be an incubator there. But then all of those are services and inputs there. What's the long lasting impacts? And so just imagine the impacts on our early learners and their families, uh, the immediate impacts and the long lasting impacts, uh, impacts from an economic development standpoint, the impact in, um, that we will have on poverty and ending cycles of, of poverty, um, workforce, allowing families to go to work. Now that I can afford childcare, now I can, can go to work. Those social determinants of health, um, that I mentioned. So I will stop there and then again remind you of ways that you can continue to remain engaged um, in this conversation again through our thought exchange. Um, those of you that may not have been on early on at the call, uh, you can take your camera phone your, your, on your cell phone and scan this QR code to take you directly to this um, um, thought exchange to leave us your feedback and just respond to the question that's listed there on your um, on your screen. So our next steps, um, again, the thought exchange will be open through April uh, to, through tomorrow evening. And then um, we'll present the proposal. There will be a budget um, and boundary workshop at 5 p.m. on Monday. And then um, the regular board meeting will start at 6. Uh, you're more than welcome to tune in to that 5 o'clock uh, budget and boundary update that the board will receive. The board will hear the proposal and um, um, we'll ask them to uh, take action on our proposal, um, whether um, vote for the proposal or um, send us you know, in another direction. So with that, talk entirely too long, I will stop sharing um, the screen and open it up for conversations. And, and before I do that, I, I will say this, um, conversations and questions around um, why are you doing this to the Kennedy community, you know, and the impact and questions around why are not, why are not, why, why, why not one centrally located or why not one in West Lawrence? And I'll, I'll be honest, and I shared this with some folks. Um, I wouldn't want, I, I wouldn't want this early childhood community center in West Lawrence. Um, I think the, the benefit of, of putting it in an area that has the greatest need um, is, is a wise decision in terms of the impact and the resources and support that can be that can be provided for the families and and communities there. Um, and, and people say, well, you don't understand the, the families. I will tell you this. I've all of my life's educational work has been in um, high poverty areas, uh, whether it's in Montgomery, Alabama or, or Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I grew up in poverty in a, in a single white trailer, similar to some of the trailers that are in the, the Kennedy area. I, I get it. I understand the 
emotional toll. I understand the the burden that this is um, having on our, our families. Uh, but when I think about the um, um, benefits of this early childhood community center, um, it excites me and it it definitely energizes me. So with that, I will stop and be quiet and open it up for questions, feedback. Dr. Lewis, Elizabeth Tice. I'm a parent of two children at Kennedy. I have some questions about the number of enrollment. So you stated that there's 185 children currently enrolled in Kennedy? Somewhere around there, yes. Okay, so, and then you said that the building is at 46.3% capacity. Currently, yes. So what is the total capacity of the building? What is it? 400? 400. Okay, yes. but then how many early childhood, because right now Kennedy has early childhood, how many students are currently enrolled in early childhood? It's a little over uh, a little over 100. I know Kevin's on here, Esther's on here. Um, please feel free to chime in. Uh, I know there are about eight classrooms there. We have our uh, early childhood classrooms there, our um, uh, special education early childhood classrooms, and I think there's one Head Start classroom there. Uh, Esther or Kevin, do you have those exact numbers? I'm going to rely on Esther. <laughs> I don't have the exact numbers with me. So then does the 46.3%, that's including K through five and early childhood? No, that's just including K-5. If you notice on the slide, it had just had K-5. That doesn't include um, K-5. Okay, so isn't that number a little deceptive if there is 100 some odd kids going there for early childhood and there's 158 Kennedy students? I mean, your capacity is not, I mean, the building's not really being utilized at 46.3%. Right, but when we look at it from a funding standpoint, um, we, we are, um, the K-5 is funded differently than, than early childhood. So, for example, the, the Head Start class that's there, um, that's we, the district doesn't pay for that that classroom. And so when we think about, because um, I received this question, um, how are you looking to potentially expand? Uh, you, you said that there's budget issues. How are you looking to expand early childhood classrooms? This will not cost the district anything. We will look at, again, providers similar to Head Start that's able to either self-fund or um, have grants to, to fund those. And so when we look at overall capacity, uh, we're just looking at K-5 because that's how our funding, that, that's how we fund um, just the, the, the K-5 when we're looking at, uh, from, from looking at it from a budgetary standpoint. Okay, but a budgetary standpoint is different than actual children in that building. Like when you go to Kennedy, there are a lot of kids there. It seems silly to say that this is one of the, you're pointing to this as one of the reasons as why you're going to close down K through five and disperse the students. It just doesn't make, I understand from a budget, that's how you have to do it, but it shouldn't be used as a justification for saying the building is only at this capacity because those other students in early childhood are using the other parts of the building that the Kennedy students are using. Right, but again, the funding source is different, K-5 and early childhood. Okay. And so then the other thing is, is my two children, they walk 0.8 mile of um, every day to go to school. And now we're scheduled, we're, we would have to go to Prairie Park, which is two miles away. So my girls go from walking 15 minutes to school in the morning to now they're going to have to walk 50 minutes every morning. That seems a little cruel to do to a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, we are looking at potentially what, what the cost would be if we move that 2.5 current transportation, uh, just getting some cost on what it would be for two miles, what it would be for 1.5 miles. Again, that will be additional cost. Um, and then, uh, um, so, so yeah, and so again, we're, we're working with safe routes to school to make sure if a student does have to walk a longer route, that route is, 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 is a lot safer. Because we should not kid ourselves, 23rd and Harper is a highway. It is the old, it's old K-10, people treat it as a highway. It seems a little, we talk, you guys want to talk about accountability, but then you're saying, oh, well, it's out of our hands of children cross at 23rd. It seems, it does not seem fair. No, no, it's certainly not out of our hands because we currently have students that cross, cross 23rd. Yes, but they cross 23rd where at 
O dash. They it's over by Schweigler, right? Right. Okay. Well, they have crossing guards, and people, the speed limit is slower there. I think you're forgetting that on the edge of town, people shoot out of there. No. So again, if you if you drive any one of our school zones, you may see a flashing light that has a different speed limit. And so when we look at that area and work with the city, you may see another flashing light that that will slow that traffic down as as, as well. And so again. We will work with the city to make sure that our students are able to cross those streets safely. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Someone else? Kristen, I think you're on mute. Kristen Kurtzoff, I think you're on mute. Oh. So do you have a slide for the projected numbers of enrollment in the next five years for the early childhood education? No, currently we do not um, have any um, um, projected enrollment for early childhood. So at this point, you don't know if you can get your percentages for the building up any higher or not, right? For Kennedy? For the early childhood? Yeah, again, our district will not have additional costs. Uh, not talking, can you mute? Our district will not incur additional costs for additional early childhood classrooms there. So, for example, if um, there's an additional Head Start class, an early Head Start class, that will be self funded and will not cost um, the district anything. In addition to the early childhood classes there, as I mentioned on that last slide, um, there could potentially be a dental clinic, a medical clinic. Um, a WIC office, um, whatever would benefit that community again, and it would not be an additional cost to the district. All right, this sounds great for an inner city, but this is not an inner city. Have you seen, okay, I wanna make sure that you understand um, that Kennedy is one of our highest um, um, SES, social economic status buildings, our highest free reduced lunch building. So whether it's an inner city or not, it could be a rural area. We're trying to meet the needs of that community there. Okay, but I was asking, do you have enough low-income three- and four-year-olds where that percentage for the building is going to be higher than 46% that you're projecting for the elementary K through five? Well, let me see. I'm just wondering because we shut down East Heights just down the street, and it's not being used for that. Well, East, East Heights is currently being used for our Special education C train. Right, but we shut it down years ago when I was in high school for early childhood education. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work out. Are you limited? So I'm asking you. Enrollment for childhood education to only those in the Kennedy area? If not, would that open up chances to increase the enrollment in that facility? Those that, those that can qualify. For example, for Head Start, they qualify for Head Start. So those families that qualify for Head Start uh, will potentially take advantage of of those early childhood classes. The one, Dr. Lewis, I heard can a, I just yeah, ask one second. For, I heard a question okay. around: uh, Are we limiting the enrollment of early childhood? That depends on the number of seats that we're able to uh, fund there. And seats, when I say it's fund there, would be how many Head Start classes can we have there? What other potential business that may want to sponsor a classroom there. So all that will depend on um, the number of seats that we have available in terms of capacity. I'm sorry, Anna, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna offer some clarification because I think someone was asking about our capacity and then just in general, if whoever the community partner that would potentially move in the space, it would just depend on the early childhood um, population that they're serving. Um, the data that we are using to determine that there is a need came from the studies that Dr. Lewis shared um, earlier in the presentation around um, there is a need for it in the greater community of Lawrence. But we, what we know is um, how many classrooms we currently have at Kennedy, but we can't predict or um, say, yes, we'll have this partner and they're going to have that many seats. So if that, if I'm not misunderstanding your question for the um, expansion component, that's the, um, is what we would know once we start those collaborations. 
And for the question about East Heights, um, the East Heights program was moved to Kennedy and that's currently that whole wing. So it was just relocated. And now that building is being used for um, several um, special ed um, transition programs, Project Surge, um, there's a therapeutic classroom there. There are different programs there um, that uh, most of them serve like older um, students um, with uh, different um, needs across the district. Right, I'm aware of that, but we just remodeled it and expanded it. So I am wondering if you guys know for sure that there is enough three and four year olds that are low income fitting the criteria to fill that school, or are we gonna have a repeat? I, I do feel like before we remodeled and expanded the school, we might've been able to fill it up, but let's be real lawrence it you can't be too low income to f live here edgewood isn't that big i mean we have no ghettos here the low income is not what it is in an inner city to fill this entire school so basically we ha there's a possibility that it's going to be a repeat of east heights and i think that's where the misconception lies i remember when I first <laughs> When I first got here and I was sharing some of the data in Lawrence Public Schools, let me mute everyone, I'm sorry. When I was sharing some of the data of Lawrence Public Schools and I shared the slide of our free and reduced lunch rate, someone in the audience asked, are you sure that that's, that's correct? I don't think our free and reduced lunch rate is that high. So I think that's a misconception in Lawrence, similar to the misconception of people thinking that we don't have homeless population, they're coming over from Topeka. That's certainly not true. Our current free and reduced lunch rate in Lawrence Public Schools alone is close to 40%. And so, yes, the the children are there. The the, the need is, is definitely there. If you mention, if you look at that Douglas County Health Study, our anti-poverty anti um, plan, you'll see that that need is there for families and, and to have child care. So, so yes, I, I anticipate us um, probably having a waiting list for, for families there. One more question. Can you share with us what type of alternative options that you've researched besides using Kennedy for early childhood? Yes, and I'll also ask anyone, I think there's a couple of people on from the Budget and Program Evaluation Committee to also chime in. Um, there were a number of things that the Budget and Program Evaluation Committee looked at. One, we don't want to um, mass layoff um, a, lot of our, a lot of our staff to, to get to this one point. Um, $2 million. There were things like, um, I think multi-age classrooms were looked at. Um, who else was on the budget and program evaluation committee? I know Kelly, you were on, Kelly, can you speak to that? I think you were on track in terms of, the thing I would say is that the options we looked at, none of them left us with something as positive and on track for our equity and, um, goals for the district as an early childhood education center. All of the options left us with a, a lot of hurt and no and no uh, no good to come from it. It's a it's a tough spot to be in um, in terms of the options that were presented to us. What are the options that were presented to you? The ones that, and I can jump in, Kelly, um, I don't have it pulled up, multi-age classrooms, which um, would have um, caused us, I think, to reduce um, staff by an additional 14 people. Um, it had also, the, uh, they considered making Kennedy a K-2 in New York, 3-5. And then there, I, those are the two that I think had the, those, the three plus this one um, were the three that had the most discussion around them that I can think of off the top of my head. But all of that information is public and linked to the uh, budget program and evaluation committee minutes. And um, um, I think so, the links may be up now of the actual meetings that were recorded most recently. 
But in addition to that, at the middle school level, um, I think they have reduced their staff um, by 10. And at the high school level, their staff was reduced um, prior to last year. And based off the number of students, they didn't have a significant drop in students at the high school level. So their staffing stayed um, the same. If we did nothing, um, one of the things that we did um, uh, that is just a reality. If we did nothing, we still would be talking about um, what school would look like because it would look different because we've lost 400 students. So we probably would be um, in this scenario. We are 100 percent sure that anybody that wants to continue with the district will be able to continue with their a job. Um, in the pr other scenarios, we would have been terminating and laying people off because our we our staffing ratio was out of whack with the number of students that are present. So tell me what the projections are of the staff that you will organically um, reduce due to this change. If this change goes through, would that be equal to or equivalent to the 14 that you would have to do um, reduce with a multi age classroom and multi age classrooms actually have a lot of good research and evidence. They're actually pretty good structures and i don't disagree with you the staffing number dr lewis um showed um on the last slide um i don't have it memorized the multi-age conversation actually got tabled for a future because of the professional development that would be required um for our um staff to be ready to go with that and the it it just there were some great, great concern around that from those that were on the committee. So that one, that's where it um, kind of got stalled at. And I don't that's disagree with you about the multi-age component. The reality of um, what we are facing, and if you're not um, following what's happening um, at the with our legislators um, around funding, we still next year at this time we'll probably be talking about unless something changes multi-agent classroom and those types of things it's just the reality of how education is funded in kansas intersecting with the fact that we um have lost 600 students what are your projections of staff that you will lose dr lewis can you pull that slide back up um I, I I don't have it. I mean, we had it. He pulled it up there. The number of staff. I think it's six um, certified staff. But if he can go back and pull it up, we can look at it. So six teachers. So eleven total um, in this scenario. So that's three less than a multi-age classroom that has a lot of really good um, efficacy for children. Yeah, and don't quote me on the 14 because I don't have that slide up, but they were um, in the similar ballpark. But yes, if, if it's 14, it would be three, uh, three less. And have you lost any currently? Like, have you received additional resignations? or retire notices of retirement since this proposal was um, put before you or put before us, whatever. Um, in comparison to the resignation and retirements that we see every year, it's not a um, out of proportion. We actually have fewer um, right now. If Sam Rizone, she can confirm than we've had in past years for around this time, but it's not. Now, I can't speak to whether someone's like, I'm not doing, if this happens, I'm resigning. I cannot answer that, but the numbers are not um, way up because of this particular um, proposal. There's a question about um, what would the capacity be of those, where's my notes, or of the um, 
oh, all the all the other buildings. <clears throat> so from from Kennedy, we have 19 students going to New York, uh, 75 students going to Cordley, and 78 going to um, Prairie Park. So that would um, enrollment at New York would be 221. The enrollment at Cordley would be 285. And this was on those screens. Um, and the Roman at Prairie Park will be 442. And I think that puts Prairie Park around 85, 86% uh, capacity. And I, I see a, a couple of questions in the chat regarding why can't we just put early childhood all over the uh, um, at the different schools or, or shift it. And I think Julia um, responded saying additional funding would be needed to add additional classes. But if you just like spread it all around and don't address it, it doesn't address the fact that we've lost students. So we're still talking about the staffing being over, um, having more staffing than we need for students. So you you could do that, but you wouldn't address the issue of the staffing component. Right, but if we're moving students from one school to another, and then we're moving teachers to those schools to make more students, why is there not other classrooms? You mean to tell me there's not an additional classroom? You couldn't move students around? and other schools to make room for one or two early childhood development classes. I'm not saying every school, but I mean, we literally have East Heights that's sitting empty. You guys redid Kennedy. There's no, I don't feel that there's any reason why you can't have one grade level per class at Kennedy. There's not enough students, all right, well then one second grade class. Why are we closing that school just for early childhood? Then you need to use East Heights and Kennedy. So we're not closing it just for early childhood. And, and uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, um, what you're mentioning wouldn't give us much savings. It's almost like we're nickel and diming our way to the 1.2 million. And we will not be um, renting it out and making money off of it. I think that's a misconception as well. We cannot, legally we cannot. So are you guys going to continue the online learning for the families that choose to next year? Those that enroll in virtual school will, but no, if you're coming to a brick and mortar, you will be first and the online option will be longer. So are your numbers as if everyone's coming back? If, is it 50%, at least 50% of the students are coming back? So you really only 50%? I do yeah. know some families chose to leave the district because you guys chose to not do hybrid right off the start and they went to Eudora and Baldwin. And I know a lot of those families are not choosing to come back. So, yeah, so your numbers I, could totally be off. So Lena, I will share with you <laughs> to be as accurate as possible. All of our principals reached out to the families who left and we have a running list of families who are coming back for sure. And that's how we got to the 50%. We didn't just kind of guess it. A 50% of the families who left have we've contacted and they said they'll be back. There were um, a few families that were undecided and the principals are still in contact with them, but they are factored into that. And then there were families who either went to private school, moved to Eudora, Baldwin or somewhere else, and they have emphatically told us they're not coming back. So that's what our projections are based off of. Um, and they continue to reach out to those families um, to update those numbers. And as far as the um, remote learning, just to be clear, the um, is now not an option based off re recent um, law or statute. I may be using the wrong word that's passed that either, you know, if you are a, a school district, you have to have a virtual option if you're going to out, out, offer vir virtual or full in person. So the three options that we provided families this year we will only be able to offer two. Either you're going to be enrolled full time in a brick and mortar, or you have, or you can go to virtual. And that also 
is impacting and um, families is, are making decisions around that. Hi, I have a quick question. So as a kid who um, grew up and my school was closed my fourth grade year, what are you going to do to help the kids transition to the new schools? Because it was a traumatic experience for me because I lost the majority of my friends. I had to learn a whole new routine and it was a terrible experience. How are you going to be able to help the students with that? So if, if the board um, approves the proposal, we could begin that um, shortly after that. The good thing is one of the things that we've taken from this pandemic is this platform that we have here. Um, I was in one of our buildings and they were having a WebEx meeting with another class in that building at another school. And so um, by utilizing that platform, this is just an example of uh, introducing the students to um, other students at that school and introducing them, their, just introducing them to their teachers. And this is something that I really want to be intentional, ten, intentional about uh, because I understand and, and, and have been through this before in terms of students transferring to another building and not feeling welcome. Um, um, we can have potential meet the teacher nights here in the spring. Um, there are some things that we can do um, again during the day, um, and some summer to an, to an open house, um, but really wanting to make sure that um, students feel welcome, students and staff feel welcome um, at, at those schools. So that transition process uh, can begin shortly after um, we found out if this is going to happen or not. Okay, I got one more question for you. Um, so with the transition, so there will obviously be more kids in bigger classrooms. Um, how, like, obviously, like, some of the staff is going to get cut. Like, you can't avoid that no matter how you look at it, unfortunately. So how are you going to be able to get the kids one on one help if they need it? So, as I mentioned earlier, um, with our ESSER funds and what those are, are funds that, as a result of COVID that uh, we, that we are receiving from the federal government, um, our estimated costs would, would be around $6 million um, that we can use for the purposes of responding to COVID. And um, we, we cannot use it to address our shortfall, the 1.2 million that we have here. Um, I wish we could, we would certainly do that. Um, but we are able to provide additional supports to students from an academic standpoint, looking at their assessment scores, looking at their social and emotional uh, well-being, providing that that one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And then again, those schools that are Title I schools will also have uh, funds to address those unique needs as well. You're breaking up classrooms that have been together um, for you know three to four years. So you're sending children, you're breaking up a classroom and sending them to three different locations. So you're talking about having children who have spent a good part of their education going to school with the same people and the same teachers and then sending them to a different school with a large majority of new teachers. Um, and so I didn't really hear an answer on how you were planning to address that other than just doing what every school does, which is doing a back to school night and introducing teachers and kids to each other. Like that's not an answer to how you're going to address the impacts to these children and families. What more on do you up their schools. they do? Yeah. yeah, maybe you didn't understand me. Hold on, let me mute some folks here. Um, so, no, it will not look like your traditional back to school night in your meet the teacher night. This will be in addition, and this will be specifically for Kennedy students going to Corley, New York, Prairie Park. The good thing is, with the exception of New York, New York is um, 19 students going there. Cordley and Prairie Park are getting 75 um, Kennedy students. And so for students to see familiar faces, uh, from their home school will be an, an added benefit. And so the answer to your question again is starting as soon as we find out, you know, if this is going to happen, starting working with the Kennedy staff, the receiving um, teachers to begin introducing themselves, um, having activities. There may be a time where um, they may well back in, in, into the class and where they're able to see and meet new faces and meet um, new students. And so it, it will look different than your traditional meet the teacher night. And we will be intentional about that. Dr. Lewis, we are still in the middle of a pandemic. Is it really a wise idea to take small classrooms, split the kids up and put them into bigger classrooms? 
Like, how are the kids going to social distance? Does, does this really make sense to do this? Yes, so the class sizes will be similar to the class sizes um, that they are now, um, and we are uh, in many of our buildings. And so we will still, if if in August, we're still under guidelines of, of CDC, which we probably will be until all students get their, their, their vaccinations, uh, we will still have those um, um, air filters in our schools. Um, students will probably still be wearing masks in the fall. So we will still still continue with our current mitigation strategies to keep Wait. the students safe. But your class sizes, by your own charts, are going to be bigger if the children are split up than what they are currently have at Kennedy. Right. So what's your um, And I wanted to circle back real quick. Um, you mentioned that there was $6 million that had been allocated to address COVID-related issues. How is the fact that you have, what was it, did you say 50 or so? students um, not returning um, because of the impact of COVID? It seems to me that the enrollment numbers have been affected by COVID. Is there something that specifically speaks to you not using some of that funding to address that shortfall? Yes, the, the federal guidelines that we are we have to follow in terms of using those funds will not allow us to take that six point something million dollars and put it toward this one point two million dollar shortfall. <laughs> Dr. Lewis, sorry, sorry. I'm trying to find you. Well, that's Kelly Snyder, okay. and then this is Lauren Mitchell. Um, sure, it's okay. uh -oh. Who's going to go? Lauren, you go ahead. Okay. So I feel I have a couple things that I would like to share and speak my truth here is what I'm noticing is that we have a lot of um, we have some parents and families on here expressing some really um, serious emotions <laughs> and concerns, rightfully so, that I feel I feel really mad and angry and frustrated that they were not given the chance to serve on a committee. Where was Kennedy's committee? Because I'm hearing from teachers at other schools, because you know, teachers talk. You think maybe we're in isolation right now. We talk, I know what's happening and what's being said at other schools. That there's gonna be a committee in the next year to talk about redrawing boundaries and parents are gonna be pulled in and teachers are gonna be pulled in. And if that's not true, you stop me. But that's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm what hearing. You're hearing is what, I, and I, I will speak directly to that. I spoke with Hillcrest staff today, and because the option 2A um, talked about having the ESL students from Kennedy and Prairie Park going to Courtley, and I said that came up from an ESL conversation. It's not going to be presented to the board on Monday night, but the reality of it is when you look at shifting, uh, looking at a more comprehensive boundary shift, if that were to occur, um, we always like, and I use this example, we come and engage the community in the families and um, in the staff as we talk about the impact. So I, I explained that the boundary committee is the boundary committee and the members of the boundary committee uh, say, Stabilize, but um, when it starts to impact it, we would we would engage. So how that was interpreted or what people took away from that, um, I'm not really sure. But Dr. Lewis and I spoke to the Hillcrest staff today because at the at the presentation when we talked about ESL, there was a question asked about if those students from the smaller schools who are being sent over to other schools, if they were to be in their home school, what would be the impact? So we just create, presented that information so people would know that. And then um, there was a question around, would there be a full comprehensive boundary look? And I said that question has come forth by some community members, as well as some board members, and that would be the next conversation that the boundary committee would engage in um, from the direction 
of the board and that being transparent, that that is a reality that what we presented in 2A could possibly be something that would be explored in the future. So there was no an, um, uh, ill intent to um, not honor and engage the Kennedy um, community. Um, the unfortunate component is this is a compressed timeline is not to say that if it's talked about in the future that it would not be. I mean, the hope would not be that it would be a compressed timeline, but those things are coming up. And so those are things that we would have to deal with. And I thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Um, I guess I just it just seems like there's so many little compartments of all of this that just don't seem to be bubbling to the surface. And I I want I want them to be all presented. And I and I think about there is some language in some of the spreadsheets regarding ratios and that eventually ratios on the west side will be lower, teacher to student ratios. And I'm um, thinking, do how does that play into this as well? Because it does play into it. And are, are we being honest to our Kennedy families that, okay, we're gonna close Kennedy and you're gonna get a, this wonderful early childhood center and the west side you also are going to have lower ratios because is is that a part of that in the next couple so, of years is this part so, of it or in the conversation about lowering our ratios across the district has been one that the board has engaged in or want, um, financially been trying to figure out, I would say for the last, since the budget and program and evaluation committee has come into existence. So this, what I would not want this to turn into is a east side versus west side and the haves and the have nots and this is big, because that is not. So several of these components have always been out there and it's just come to a point where some decisions have to be made around it. But the um, issue with class size across the district has been a conversation and you can go back and look at the original budget program evaluation committee minutes have always been around class size, the topics that we're always addressing class size and um, pay for both certified and classified staff and how to increase the pay while trying to um, address class size at all levels. So while I recognize that with everybody coming to this experience, they are coming with the emotions and their um, real experience, I would hope that as a community, collectively, we don't start to try to pit different um, size of the community um, against one another, everybody um, will be impacted in a different way. But I, I, I just don't want that narrative to start to be out there because that really will only um, divide the community and that is not healthy for our students, our staff, or our families to feel like if, I, if this occurs, it's good for you and not me. Like we are really, trying to make the best decisions for all of our students, all of our staff, none of the, any time that you have to reduce a budget, there are no good answers. Um, and somebody will not necessarily like the outcome. So I, I um, recognize, feel the emotion. It, I, I, we too are um, have emotion behind this, um, but I do not want this, to turn into East versus West, have versus have nots, um, when this is something that this committee, this committee of teachers, of administrators, of board members, of classified and certified staff are, are grappling with and really trying to come up with the best solution that um, in the um, long run, hopefully would have the least negative impact. But there is conversation about 
in conjunction with this that has always been had and about if we we've we've been looking at changing the ratio for I know at least two years, however long, two to three years, and there have been tweaks and things at different points um, throughout. Um, so yes, it's happening at the same time, but it doesn't mean it's happening because of this. Dr. Lewis, uh, my name is Mark Harper and I'm with Cornerstone Academy. And I'd like to say this, I'd like to say this to the board and I'd like to say this to the parents uh, that they're going to be affected uh, by the transition of uh, McKinney School. Uh, the early childhood education system across the nation has been rocked completely by COVID. Uh, myself and my wife, we owned uh, two uh, early childhood education centers, one in the urban core in Kansas City, Kansas, that sat on the corner of 7th Street, 7th and State Avenue. Uh, we were open throughout uh, the duration of the pandemic. And we have seen, we have seen uh, firsthand how it has impacted the children first. It has impacted the families. It has impacted the financial, uh, the financial freedom of the family and it has rocked the community completely. And I completely understand that's the reason why we have decided to come to Lawrence to help uh, Douglas County and the city of Lawrence with the early childhood education uh, problem because there needs to be uh, enough people uh, who are uh, who who are dedicated uh, to the children and to to the early childhood education system to see uh, a, a flourishing uh, a flourishing matter come come to a head. Uh, the concern is the concern is always money around early childhood education because money is very important because if, there, if you don't have the money, you, you do not, you cannot hire quality staff. And that is, that is a huge issue right now in early childhood education. Uh, uh, we have seen children with uh, social and emotional and learning uh, dis uh, disabilities uh, become affected by uh, directors and uh, center, center coordinators just hiring uh, mid-level or low-level educators to help during the pandemic, and they, they have been affected. So I completely understand um, your position uh, as the school board, and I completely understand your position as the parents, uh, and you are, you are completely concerned, but I say this to you that uh, the city of Lawrence, Douglas County, they are doing exactly what they can with what they have, with what they have because the, the, the resources are not limited, but they have to be allocated in certain areas so they can continue to, to receive those funds. And I'm saying that as a business owner and as an early childhood education uh, center owner, that those funds have to be allocated. I believe, I believe that that the that the Lawrence School Board, they're going to do great things with the McKinney with the McKinney uh, building, uh, bringing early childhood education, uh, so they can so they can they can utilize the spaces that they do have within those schools and hire uh, different staff. So I support you, the parents, and I support the school board, and we. Uh, we are anxiously ready to get to work in the city of Lawrence to help with this problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Lewis? Yes. My, my name is Kelly Snyder. Uh, I understand that the budget is obviously important, but the daily experiences of students should really be at the forefront of this proposal. And that's something that we hope we get right after the proposal is approved. Um, my eighth grader graduated from Kennedy. Um, when she heard of this proposal, she immediately informed me that the majority of her classmates walk to school both ways every day, no matter the weather, amount of light or traffic. And most of these kids had to get to school extra early 
for free or reduced breakfast. Um, walking two miles takes a really long time, especially for the youngest of students. You know, with transportation being such a crucial part of a child's day, this proposal really shouldn't be considered without formal transportation plans in place rather than informal conversations, as mentioned per Julie Boyle in the chat. I can't help but wonder what else is being overlooked um, and is being saved for after the proposal gets rammed through. It seems really unfair that we weren't included in this conversation until it seems like it's already destined to pass. Okay. Again, we will um, continue to work with our families, work with our um, transportation partners at, at First Student, work with the city to make sure that our students are getting to school um, safe. Um, just conversations today, um, I've learned with, with, with First Student involved, I learned that First Student is in the process of purchasing vans um, because one, they're, they're cheaper, um, there may be not, op, there may be opportunities for them to just pick up a small group of students, and then most importantly, vans do not require a licensed CDL driver, and so there may be some um, um, ways we can, you know, work with first student to make sure our students are getting to school so safe. So please, I'm, I'm not just but sit, don't you think but, that something that's so important we should have like figured out in place before we we pass the proposal and not just hope we get it figured out afterwards? No, uh, I always say hope is not a strategy, but we will not hope. We will actively um, get it resolved. Um, obviously, Mark, I'm sorry, April 12th is the date that we will present the proposal to the to the board. And we have um, definitely time to make sure that we are working with our, again, first student uh, staff city to make sure our students are getting to school safe. Thanks for your time. Thank you for being here. Dr. Lewis, I would like to circle back. Is so we're going to, to we're going to close Kennedy and we're going to ship the kids to different schools. But then it's brought up the possibility that in a few more years we're going to have to revisit it like closing Cordley or New York. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, so again, just like no one could have predicted a pandemic, a pandemic, I can't predict whether students will not return. Uh, is my, I, I would really like to believe most of our students will return back. Um, in the event that we lose more students, yes, we will bring these conversations uh, up with other um, ways that we can meet our budget restraints. And if that means um, closing another building, um, we will have to make those decisions and we will bring that proposal to the board. So we spent all this money to redo a bunch of schools and we have small neighborhood schools that children can walk to and get to. And we're just like, there's no other options except shutting them down for the budget. Um, either closing them or making some other drastic um, cuts. And that, you know, would be, of course, we need our staff to educate our, our students. Um, so we would just have to, again, engage our budget and program evaluation committee and look to, to look at the budget and, and present proposals that um, if there is a budget shortfall, that will address that at, at that time. Again, no one predicted this. This is not something that I um, accepted this job to, to do in three years that there's going to be a pandemic and I want to close buildings. No one predicted this to happen. It's just the sad reality of, of, of where we are, you know, in terms of um, public schools all across the country. Is there a particular reason why you can't wait a year and continue to um, have this conversation and throughout the year to give it more time? Um, was that not namaste? Namaste. Nam namaste. Um, your question was probably my exact question verbatim. Uh, an executive leadership team meeting um, with uh, Kathy Johnson and some other members of, of the team. We have to come up with $1.2 million this year. Uh, while I would love to, to, to wait a year, we, we don't have the gift of time uh, as it relates to um, where we are financially. 
I would really like to hear more about mental health supports for the children. You're talking about having children in all the schools, as a matter of fact, who will be coming back from a year of pretty much isolation. And that has impacted children immensely. And now you're talking about with Kennedy having children um, who will never return. It's just like a blip, just like, you know, in Avengers, right? There's just a blip. Their school's gone. Their teachers are gone. Their classmates are gone. And all of a sudden they're in a new school after a whole year of isolation. And you haven't mentioned any mental health supports for those children um, when you've asked about transitions. Yeah, I don't know if you were on when I did mention that as part of the transition, um, we have ESSER funds that we can support students um, that's based on COVID related things. And this pandemic has certainly affected students academically, socially, socially and emotionally. And so even as early as um, this summer, there will be supports for all of our students, again, from academic, social, and emotional standpoint. And as I mentioned, we will be intentional about the supports that we provide our Kennedy students going to Prairie Park, Corley, and, and New York. And not to mention our current um, counselors and mental health workers, our Burt Nash partnership that we have uh, for the supports we have right now for our students, that will continue as well. So you're gonna open up mental health services to the children over the summer? Yes, we will have mental health services for our students throughout the summer. And we did. Is that going to be facil facilitated at? Like, I'm I'm not familiar. Uh, the wrap workers don't work generally very much during the summer. Um, the school counselors, I don't think that they do that much during the summer. So, tell me a little bit more about that yeah. program. You have yeah, I'll be happy to. Um, our summer learning will include a huge social and emotional um, component as well. Yes, academics are are important, but our kids just, are just coming through a pandemic. And so it's important for us to make sure that we are providing supports and services for our students um, over, over the summer. And so, again, with those ESSER funds, which these are funds that we typically typically don't have, uh, we will make sure that those supports are, are there with licensed social workers, counselors um, over the summer. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Where is that happening? What's the plan that you have in place so far? How meeting. are you identifying the children that are going to need those supports? Uh, stay, tuned, stay tuned for a summer school report um, to our board that's coming up soon. And can I say, and I'm going to say just, that, just as a, I, um, I believe that we are in both social workers. So I'll just say that we did partner, increase our partnership with Burton Ash this year. And we did more more than just RAP this year. So um, it's true about the, the gap in services for RAP in the summer. But they actually do, some of those workers do actually continue to stay with children over the summer and make sure that services aren't disrupted. And then we, we will look at that as a priority. Um, for Kennedy kids particularly, but for any kid. And we can also look at title funding as well. So it's definitely on the radar um, because I'm, I'm hearing in this conversation the concern about that and, and the grief from, from folks as we're going through um, this discussion in general. But we will definitely prioritize social emotional health. And, and we have tried to do that um, this year and we'll continue to do it every year. It's, it's so again, um, as our Boundary Committee has, you know, reformed this year. They will continue to work, you know, as we look at potential uh, budget shortfalls, they will continue to work and look at boundaries um, throughout the, the district that can assist with us uh, addressing some of our um, budget difficulties. And then to the comment that was mentioned around um, wasting money on our, our facilities, when we passed the bond, uh, the work that we did specifically at Kennedy was to um, make sure it was ready uh, for early childhood. And so we've spent a tremendous amount of money there just on Kennedy preparing it for um, early childhood, the, the students that were that were there uh, and that will be attending there um, at, at that time. And so that money is not wasted. Obviously, if the board approves, it will be an early childhood center. I don't know we had a cutoff time of a seven. I do appreciate you all hanging on. Thank you, Julie, for answering so many questions in the in the chat as well. Okay. Well, again, 
um, our board meets on April the, the 12th. Um, we do, all, as, as, as all of our board meetings, um, have patron commentary and encourage patron commentary. If, Julie, can you type the email address in the, in the chat? If you would like to address the entire board um, at the, the board meeting, Julie, I think is gonna put the email address in the, the chat and it's just patron commentary at USD 497. Um, and again, the, the thought exchange is still live. Um, we encourage you to continue to um, share, your, share your thoughts. We will continue to look at that to make sure if you have comments, questions, concerns in there that we will address them. My goal <clears throat> for this um, is, you know, obviously we had to move at, move at a much quicker pace than, and then we wanted to. Um, my goal is for people to feel, okay, I don't like this. I don't like this, the decision. Quite frankly, I'm angry at the decision, but I did have an opportunity to, to hear my voice. I mean, to have my voice um, heard. Um, I know that's, Easier said than done, and it's 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 difficult. But I'm, I do I do mean that. Okay, the board meeting again is on our YouTube channel. It's on Midco Channel Twenty Six. Again, it starts at five with a budget and um, boundary committee. I'm sorry, not committee, but a budget and boundary update from, from Kathy Johnson, and then. The regular board meeting begins at, at six. So I would encourage you to log on uh, because many of the questions will be answered during that uh, five o'clock um, board and boundary, I'm sorry, boundary and budget uh, presentation. Thank you all so much for your engagement. Thank you all for your um, questions. We will, and I'm gonna try to figure out how to save these questions. Um, we've also, thank you, Julie has, um, on our Kennedy website, created at FAQ, where we're compiling a, um, a lot of the questions that we have been receiving so that they're there in one place with answers um, so that you can go back and refer to. I'm just an email away. Our board members are, are just an email or phone call um, away. I'm also a phone call away. If you um, just want to share your frustrations with me, just if you just want me to, to listen, if you want me to answer questions, um, I'm here. To, to, to try to answer those questions as, as best as I can. There again, I got my boo at the end of the meeting. Well, I think it comes Thank from you, a place Lena. of frustration because you guys are going to close down Kennedy. It comes on the backs of some of the poorest students in the district. And you basically say, we want to have a thought exchange. We want to have it. But it's really just an area of grievances and you're going to do what you want to do anyway. It's like you did you change the boundaries, you've done all this stuff, and now it's just gonna go through. And our kids are the ones that are going to suffer. All right, again, um, we're, we're gonna be intentional about making sure that we're providing supports um, to, our, to our students doing this transition. I know this is difficult, I know this is, is an emotional time. Um, um, we're faced with these tough decisions and um, I, I feel confident with the proposal in terms of um, an early childhood center in an area that it's probably needed the most. Um, and again, we have caring teachers, we have caring adults that work in all of our buildings. Um, and again, kudos to the Kennedy staff for um, working um, these past few years and had the greatest gains of all of our elementary schools. So we know that we're, their turnaround work is hard. And so they are leaders in, in this work. And so iron sharpens iron, 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 sharpens iron. and so the, the strategies that they're going to be able to share with our other, with their other colleagues is going to be value add um, as well. So. Thank you all so much for um, being here um, and for your questions and your engagement. Have a. Did I just hear you say that this was the area where early childhood education was needed most? We're having a baby boom over here on the east side, are we? No, it's not affordable child care.
and uh, it's affordable child care in addition to uh, other resources that are potentially be in, in Kennedy. All right, thank you all so much. Have a good night. Larry Engelbrick has left the meeting. Oh. <laughs> I think I was able to save the questions this time. All right. So I'm going to save. I was them. just I was just trying to do that too. Yeah, I I have them captured, and so now I'm going to save the meeting, the recording. All right. Thank you.